Masataka Yoshida came in with a bang in his rookie year with the Boston Red Sox. But what will year two look like for him? More on today's Locked on Red Sox. You are Locked on Red Sox, your daily Boston Red Sox podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Red Sox, your daily Boston Red Sox podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Gabby Hurlbut, former ESPN social media associate and also the current host of the Boston Balling Podcast. And I am here to bring you the latest in all things Boston Red Sox, Monday through Friday, straight to your favorite podcast feed. And the best part, it's all for free. That's right. You heard it correctly. It is free. So might as well take advantage of it, right? Locked On is here for you with your team every day. This episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash LockedOnMLB and use code LockedOnMLB, all lowercase, for a first deposit match up to $100. Welcome to today's episode of the show, and opening day is just a couple more days away. Can you believe it? Another Red Sox season coming and is basically here, and the Red Sox have been busy over the last week or so really finalizing roster decisions, trying to figure out who's going to make the opening day roster, who's going to be able to be competitive in a variety of different spots because the Red Sox are definitely in a position where they have a lot of guys who have the potential to be top-tier talents in 2024 and other guys who may struggle a bit heading into the season. And One player who for sure is on the opening day roster but might see a lot of his time at the DH role is Masataka Yoshida. And with Yoshida, there was a lot of hype surrounding him when he came into the Boston Red Sox because he was coming from the Japanese League and was putting up some very strong highlights over there. And he was coming in with the expectation that he could hit for power and he could provide a lot of value to the Red Sox lineup. And in the first half of the 2023 season, he did do exactly that, but he did struggle a bit in the second half. Now he finished the season with a 289 batting average, 71 runs and 72 RBIs with eight stolen bases. He also hit 15 home runs and recorded an on-base percentage of 338 and a slugging percentage of 445. And his on-base plus slugging was 783. So he is in the mix right now of being one of those key contributors in the Boston Red Sox lineup. But the thing for him that set him back a little at the plate was that he demonstrated a lot more of an ability to hit fastballs effectively than any other pitch. So I'm looking at that as something that he could grow in a little bit more in 2024 is his ability to see other pitches better. He's able to absolutely crush fastballs, but my worry was that opposing pitchers were able to figure him out a little bit more as the second half of the season progressed because from pretty much the all-star break on, he started to struggle a lot more at the plate, wasn't making contact as much and was swinging and missing. And I feel like it's because pitchers knew that what they should be doing is just changing up their pitch selection that they were throwing to him because he was struggling a little bit more to hit those types of pitches. So heading into this season, I'm hoping that he was able to improve in that area this offseason in being able to effectively see other pitches a lot better. Overall, when you look at his numbers from the 2023 season, he overall did have solid plate discipline, and it's anticipated that he'll keep that up. During the season, he had a 14.0% strikeout percentage and a 5.9% 
walk rate to go along with that 289 batting average. So he did strike out, but not at as high of a rate as you might have thought he did in that second half of the season. He could draw some more walks, but that's something that could come with time for him. His K percentage might go up a little bit more in 2024 as he's adapting to maybe a different approach at the plate, trying to hit other pitches a little bit better but there was a noticeable difference for him as it got down to the second half of the season because there was a period in may where he was hitting over 300 his batting average was 317 at the end of may and then heading into june he had a really big month there his batting average got all the way up to 319 at one point and so for a lot of that month he was above 300 and then in July and then getting into post all-star break he did start to struggle a little bit more at the plate his batting average took a decline around August 20th his batting average at that point was 297 And then it stayed in that 280 to 290 range for the rest of the season. So it wasn't a huge drop-off like it might have seemed like it was. It was a slight drop-off in that he wasn't able to hit over 300 anymore. But overall, in the grand scheme of things still, it's hard for a player to hit over 300 all season long. And he did show consistency in his ability to be able to hit over 300 for a longer period of time. So he overall had good numbers at the plate, but if there was something to notice in terms of a pattern, it was that he did seem a lot less confident at the plate in the second half, and he did have a lot more of his struggles in the second half. And of course, that led to a lot of people saying, Yoshida's a bust, you know, the Red Sox shouldn't have signed him. We could have done something else this offseason and not brought him in. And I don't like jumping to conclusions like that on him, especially with his plate appearances. Now, his defense was a significant struggle in 2023. He was one of the worst outfield defenders. He made a lot of errors out there, and his arm strength wasn't quite up to par with where it needed to be in order to be successful in the outfield at Fenway Park. So the one thing for him that I took away from the 2023 season was, okay, this guy needs to fix his defense or not play defense as much. And the Red Sox, sure enough, took the latter approach for that solution and said, okay, in 2024, we're not going to have him play as much defense and we're going to have him focus primarily on being a designated hitter and hitting in that spot so that he can get more acclimated and get more comfortable to focusing on his plate appearances. Now, one thing that could benefit him in that way is that if you're only focusing on one thing as opposed to more than one thing at a time, that could be hard mentally on somebody. And that goes for any job, really, not just somebody who's a professional athlete. If you have less responsibility, then naturally you're going to feel more confident because you can focus on perfecting that one thing. And for Yoshida, Coming into a league that he was unfamiliar with and having to adapt to playing in Major League Baseball, playing at Fenway Park, adapting to the environment there, having to play defense in an outfield that's very difficult to play defense in, having to make his plate appearances and having to really embrace being part of what the Fenway experience was about. That's a lot to ask for a player to do all at one time. And for him we knew when the Red Sox signed him that he didn't have the best defensive numbers originally and that's not why the Red Sox brought him in they brought him in because they liked his offense and his ability on the offensive side of the ball to really make his mark and improve in that regard and make the Red Sox line up better in that regard defense was not his strong suit and the Red Sox didn't need it to be So now they're able to 
add another solution by saying, okay, let's just have him focus more on one thing. So hopefully taking out that pressure of having to play defense and nail that side of the ball at Fenway Park when he already struggles defensively will take away some of his stresses and worries and he'll be able to focus more primarily on just perfecting his offense and being able to see the ball better and just become a better hitter than he already is. I think we're going to see a bigger season from him at the plate because of all those reasons that I mentioned. I expect him to do really big things on the offensive side of the ball, make an argument for an all-star bid offensively, which he was doing in the first half of the season. I think we'll see more of that Yoshida shine through in 2024. Hopefully he's more confident knowing he doesn't have to play as much defense, so it won't be taking as much of a toll on him. So I'm expecting big things from him. I'm excited for his 2024 season. I think if he goes along with Devers, a hopefully healthy Trevor Story and Tristan Casas in the lineup, he's somebody who could be right up there as a big contributor offensively. I just hope that this offseason he's really worked on being able to hit other pitches more effectively. So I'm rooting for him. Hopefully he's able to succeed in that role as a primary designated hitter. And coming up, a player who made the opening day roster after certainly making his mark this spring could make a serious impact in 2024. So that's coming up next. Are you looking for a fun way to play daily fantasy sports Prize Picks is the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. It's the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. It's just you against the numbers. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including pros and sharks, you pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. Prize Picks even offers injury insurance so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player projection won't count against you and the rest of your entry stays live. Prize Picks now offers Apple Play for quick and easy deposits into your account this basketball season. Prize Picks is a great experience because it gives you a lot of different variety of games to play and different scenarios to select. For example, it's now March Madness and a lot of people are picking UConn to go all the way and win the whole thing. That's a fantastic choice to make. A lot of people pick Jason Tatum to score 20 plus points in a game for the Celtics because it's a very fair pick to make. So that's another one that you can make on there. Lots of different daily fantasy sports picks that you can make on prize picks. Download the app today and use code Locked On MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. That's a first deposit match up to $100 with the code Locked On MLB. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. It really is easy. And don't you love when things are simple like that? It's fantastic. So head to Prize Picks today. Are you always watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? Have to turn down the volume with all that shouting? Make the switch to Locked On Sports today. A free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports today brings you-can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. It's so great because it is free and it's 24-7, so you can stay caught up in everything going on in sports. So head to that today as well. One player who went into the spring having to prove himself to fight for a spot on the Red Sox Major League roster was Sadom Rafaela. A big thing he had going for him was his versatility and being able to play in the infield and the outfield. So it was something he definitely had as an advantage over other players who maybe were fighting for a roster spot also. 
He made his brief debut with the Red Sox last season. He slashed a stat line of a 241 batting average, 281 on base percentage, and 386 slugging percentage with two home runs and five RBIs in 28 games. He also struck out 28 times, which is a 31.5 K percentage, while drawing just four walks at a 4.5 walk percentage. In 20 spring training appearances this year, he's slashing a 278 batting average, 339 on base percentage, and 556 slugging with three home runs, four steals, and eight RBIs after collecting a single and two steals against the Twins on Saturday. Although it is just spring training, he did cut down on his strikeouts significantly, just 12 and 59 plate appearances. And one thing that the Red Sox pointed out that he really needed to focus on and work on this offseason was his ability to take professional at-bats and have better discipline at the plate. And he's shown a lot of that this offseason in his Grapefruit League appearances. He's put together a lot more professional at-bats. He's being more careful about what he's swinging at as opposed to just being super swing happy and just going for everything. He's being a lot more conscious about what he should and shouldn't be swinging at. And Alex Cora noticed a big improvement from him. He mentioned that he's just done everything that the Red Sox have asked him to do as far as his hands and attacking the zone when he needs to and just taking the pitches he doesn't need to swing at. And that's a big milestone for him because he needs to carry that over into the season and he can be a very dangerous hitter for Boston. He obviously showed a lot of expectations and a lot of things that he can do in his short stint with the Boston Red Sox in 2023, but those strikeouts were the thing that was the problem. And with Cora saying now that he's grown tremendously in that regard, hopefully he's able to apply that to the pressure of the regular season and showcase his ability to actually grow and be a competitive hitter in so many different ways. And I'm looking forward to seeing him on the Major League roster in 2024. How he'll be utilized is going to be interesting. Primarily, he'll start in the outfield, especially with Rob Snyder being injured and Yoshida primarily being DH. It makes a lot of sense to kind of have him focus more on playing in the outfield. But who knows, with the injury to Vaughn Grisham and the Red Sox infield situation right now, he could see some time there too if the Red Sox want to give him some more reps in the infield so that he can be even more of a dual threat. That is a possibility for sure, and he needs to prove himself on defense as well. But as far as his ability so far to get in that mindset of being very dominant at the major league level, he's definitely thinking about that right now. He's ready to go for the season he has understood that he had to be in control of what he could control if he wanted to break camp with the club for the first time in his career and when Alex Cora called him into his office to tell him whether he made the roster he was obviously a little bit nervous but he was also excited because it was something he had been waiting for all spring. So when Alex Cora told him he made the roster, it was just so exciting for him. And that's huge for his confidence level because it shows that the Red Sox trust him and see his ability and feel like he could be a piece of the future of the team. And that's huge for the Red Sox because When you look at the makeup of talent they have, they've been prioritizing a lot of young talent and trying to see who fits into the puzzle where down the road. And this offseason, there had been a lot of conversation about, are they going to move an outfielder? Is Duran going to get traded? Is Abreu going to get traded? Is Rafaela even going to get traded? Those names were tossed around a lot as the Red Sox were moving through the offseason, trying to navigate what they should do. And fans were not sure who was going to be moved if anybody. So for Rafaela to still be here 
and to have his opportunity on the opening day roster has to be huge for his confidence. And I'm hoping that elevates his ability to be able to compete even more in 2024, because for him, he needs to be given a reason to feel confident. And if he's feeling confident, he can go out there and absolutely light it up. And he was already playing with a sense of confidence in that he wasn't afraid to swing at anything. So now it's just a matter of toning that down. And when he gets onto that pressure of the big stage of the Major League Baseball season and he's going up against competitive pitching, can he maintain that same level of energy but do it a little more wisely in that he's not swinging at everything and he's just showing that he's gained a lot more confidence. So just this decision alone of him being put on the opening day roster has to be a fuel in the fire for him to feel like he can do big things for this team come the 2024 season and beyond. So I'm excited to see what Rafaela can do. He was obviously a very highly regarded prospect before he got called up at the end of 2023. So he has a lot of potential. So we'll see if he can apply that potential and continue to improve as this season progresses. Speaking of Rafaela, what is the outfield situation going to look like and the roster for the Red Sox heading into opening day? Coming up, I'm going to be giving a roster breakdown of what each position is looking like for the Red Sox as we approach this West Coast trip in a couple days. Are you a big sports betting fan? Is it something you've always wanted to get into but haven't really tried it yet? Either way, whatever your answer to that question was, FanDuel is the place for you. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. Just visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. FanDuel is a fantastic way to make a lot of money quickly. My fiance loves it. He makes all kinds of bets on it now. So if you're trying to make a lot of money, Head to FanDuel today. Also, you should head to Locked On Sports today as we as a network have launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. And it's now also available on Amazon Fire TV in the free Fire TV channels app. Locked On Sports today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports today, now available on the free Fire TV channels app. Locked On Sports today is so exciting for the network because nobody else does this. So if you're looking to stay caught up in all things sports all the time, Locked On Sports today is the place for you. So we are, are approaching opening day and the Red Sox are solidifying their roster, trying to finalize who's going to be in what position come opening day. They've made a lot of cuts. They've sent people down to AAA. It just happens. It's all part of how the teams operate when they're trying to finalize their opening day roster. But what does the Red Sox roster depth chart look like right now? So starting with the catching situation, Connor Wong and Reese McGuire are the two catchers. There wasn't really a doubt about that. The Red Sox did bring a couple other catchers into camp to give them a chance to compete for a spot, but there wasn't really a doubt that it was going to be Wong and McGuire. There just wasn't really seeming to be much of a change of the guard there. They wanted these two guys, and Wong has had a good spring. He's emerging as a surprising regular with a good arm and also valuable athleticism. He did hit nine homers and steal eight bases, and Reese McGuire is also totally fine as a backup. The longer-term question will be how quickly can Kyle Teal come up and change that equation. He reached double A in his first professional season and ranks as one of the top catching prospects in the game. So the question will be how fast is he going to work his way up through the system and then the Red Sox are going to have to do some evaluation on their catching situation and see what they want to do with either Wong or McGuire. But for now, those are the two guys that will be starting as the catchers. 
For corner infield, it's Tristan Casas, Rafael Devers, and Bobby Dahlbeck right now. There is a little bit of time for the Red Sox still to sign or claim a different right-handed bench bat. But for the time being, it does appear that Dahlbeck will serve as a four corners bench bat, bringing some right-handed balance alongside lefties, Casas, and Devers. And so he'll be able to be more of a backup and hopefully contribute when he can because Devers and Casas are going to need rest days. So he'll be thrown into one of their spots when they are resting. So it'll be interesting to see what exactly his path is and how he gets utilized. And another thing to think about is what happens when Rob Snyder gets healthy. This applies to the outfield and the infield situation. Snyder broke his toe in spring training and will miss at least a few weeks. He is primarily an outfielder, but he has experience at first base and is a proven right-handed platoon bat. So he could be an interesting alternative to Dahlbeck, especially giving Rafaela's versatility and ability to play in the outfield like I was talking about earlier. So if Dahlbeck is being used and isn't performing that well, then maybe when Ruff Snyder comes back, he's given an opportunity to play first base. So that's something to think about as well. In the middle infield, you're looking at Trevor Story and Manuel Valdez and Pablo Reyes to start the season Vaughn Grissom has just been derailed by hamstring and groin issues so he will not be the opening day second baseman it'll be more of Valdez and Reyes platooning at the spot with Reyes also backing up Trevor Story at shortstop because Grissom is at least a few weeks away so the one thing the Red Sox are going to have to think about is when Grissom does come back he has likely spot because when the Red Sox traded for him he was going to be the everyday second baseman so the question then becomes what do they do about Valdez and Reyes do they keep Reyes in as kind of another platoon slash fill-in second baseman and shortstop and then send Valdez back to AAA how does that go lots of things for the Red Sox to think about there but for now it's going to be Valdez Reyes and Story for the middle infield The outfield still is in question with Rafaela, Jaron Duran, Tyler O'Neill, Masataka Yoshida, and Will Urabrayu. The biggest thing here is that Yoshida is going to be taking the most at-bats at DH, so he won't really be in the outfield as much. But then it becomes, does the outfield end up being Jaron Duran, Tyler O'Neill, and Sadon Rafaela to start the season? Or does it become Duran, O'Neill, and Abreu? with Rafaela serving as that fourth outfielder, there could be a lot of moving parts here. Rafaela is likely going to be the regular center fielder, but everyone except Yoshida could also play there as necessary. So the outfield defense should be significantly improved from last year, but it's just going to depend on where people get placed and what's going to happen when Ref Snyder again comes back, who moves where. So there's a lot of shifting still that could be done in the outfield, but that's what we're looking at right now. And then when you look at the starting rotation, it's going to be Brian Bayo, Nick Pavetta, Cutter Crawford, Garrett Whitlock, and Tanner Houck. That is the starting five. The Rotation right now still has a lot of question marks. Brian Bayo is expected to be seen as that number one starter with Nick Pavetta and Cutter Crawford behind there. Garrett Whitlock and Tanner Houck, they show really good stuff out of the bullpen. So the question is, can they show good stuff consistently out of the rotation? That's something we still need to see with them. So are they going to be able to perform consistently at that level? The Red Sox, I thought, might have decided to sign another pitcher when Lucas Giolito went down with an injury, but that isn't happening. So this is what we're looking at right now for the Red Sox rotation in Bayo, Pavetta, Crawford, Whitlock, and Houck. Who knows how that rotation is going to pan out. I'm just hoping they can eat innings and be able to give the bullpen some relief because they're going to need it. The question I do have is... Because they didn't upgrade at the top of the rotation, what happens now with Winkowski being in the bullpen, the only 40-man rotation depth in AAA will be Cooper Criswell, who's made two big league starts in his career, and also Brandon Walter, who's made none. So if starting pitchers begin to get injured early, it could be a tough season for the Red Sox because they really don't have a lot of options. So that's something to look at with the rotation that could be a concern. Then with the bullpen, 
It's Kenley Jansen, Chris Martin, Josh Winkowski, Brennan Bernardino, Joely Rodriguez, Chase Anderson, who they just signed over the weekend, Justin Slayton, and Isaiah Campbell. The Red Sox have not officially set this group. Greg Weiser could still make the team who the Red Sox acquired in a trade this offseason. And there is still time for another outside audition, but with Rodriguez officially being on the roster and the fact that the Red Sox don't seem to want to make any outside additions, Anderson signing to a major league deal over the weekend and Justin Slayton impressing as a Rule 5 pick, that last spot is the only one still up for grabs, and Isaiah Campbell feels like the heavy favorite with just great spring numbers after an impressive 2023 in Seattle. So that is likely what it'll look like. And the bullpen, I expect to be pretty good again. Joely Rodriguez needs another chance given that injuries plagued his season last year. Josh Winkowski, I'm excited to see how he performs this year. He definitely has had a strong spring and had a strong season in 2023, so I'm hoping for more of that this upcoming year. Jansen and Martin, I mean, Chris Martin was one of the best relievers in baseball last year, so hopefully he can continue that as the strong bridge guy this year. Kenley Jansen's a question mark. He's faced some injuries during the spring, so can he even stay healthy in 2024? That's a big thing for me, but I do feel like the bullpen can be competitive. Justin Slayton is not being talked about enough, but I feel like he could be a huge contributor out of this bullpen as he's put up some very competitive numbers. So I am excited to see what happens with him and also with Isaiah Campbell. So it'll be interesting to see how these guys are able to contribute. And the biggest question for me with the bullpen is what's going to happen here? Are they going to get so fatigued early on because they're being overworked or are they going to be able to pitch a normal amount to where they can stay effective for the entirety of the season? That's what I'm looking at when it comes to this bullpen right now is hopefully they don't get overworked and their arms don't get tired earlier on in the season because then we could see some serious struggle coming from the bullpen as it approaches later and later in the season like we saw last year. So hopefully that pans out for them um, the rotation and the bullpen both could see some question marks. I'm not worried about the lineup. I think they'll be very good. The lineup offensively, it's just a matter of is the pitching going to crash and burn or is it going to be better than people think? That's the real question going into this season. But as always, regardless of the question marks, regardless of what could go wrong or might or might not, just got to continue to keep the faith as always. Go Red Sox, and I will catch you on the flip side.